Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve. I run Vorsprung Suspension up here in Whistler. And this episode, or part two of this episode, is continuing on from part one of this episode. Surprise, surprise. Uh, which, if you haven't watched, go and watch before you watch this so that this makes sense. So for those of you who have just watched part one, I'm going to deviate into something that you probably didn't see coming and talk about coil springs and air springs. Maybe you did see it coming. If you have not been living under a rock in the mountain bike world, you're well aware that coil springs are making something of a comeback in the mountain bike world, in the suspension world. And there are several reasons for this. For those who aren't brushed up on the history of this, basically coil springs were the first things that anyone used as a spring in uh, mountain bike suspension. Uh, over time, no, actually they weren't the first thing. Elastomers were the first thing and they were absolutely useless. Fortunately, we graduated from that to springs that weren't colossal turds and never looked back. Well, we kind of did. We went to air springs. Air springs were better in many ways. They were lighter, more adjustable, more progressive, which meant that you could run them softer in theory and still get good bottoming resistance. But they have some shortcomings as well. The spring rates are not as good. They're not as linear at the start of the travel and the middle of the travel. Coil springs do have a distinct advantage there. And for those of you who have paid attention to the things that we have been doing over the years, it's typically been to make air springs perform more like a coil spring, to linearize the initial spring rate, increase the mid-stroke support and so forth, because the coil springs simply performed better. So why is it that this heavy, relatively clunky, archaic technology is making a comeback in mountain bikes? Partly it is because the bikes have gotten lighter. And by partly I mean probably almost entirely. So thanks to the dedicated effort of product managers around the world, bikes have gotten really, really light. Product managers, probably not giving enough credit to the designers and engineers here. Everyone that's worked on developing mountain bikes to where they currently are has played a part in this. Uh, consumers have pushed for lighter and lighter bikes and it's now entirely possible to buy a bike that descends better than a downhill bike from 15 years ago that you can pedal to the top of the hill and weighs solidly six kilograms less, at least, than a downhill bike of that era. Back in the day, I was riding a 20 kilogram downhill bike and that thing was not gonna go uphill under any circumstances without a good runner <laughs> or a shuttle. As bikes have gotten lighter, we've seen carbon frames, carbon components, uh, more and more refined metal components as well suspension components themselves have gotten considerably lighter. What that has done is brought bikes down into a weight range where people have, let's say, some discretionary weight to play with. And that means we can now deliberately add weight in places where the performance benefit justifies it, rather than having to deal with the bike being either a really heavy tank or an even heavier tank and then having varying levels of performance between that, which again, going back to the early 2000s and the fragile downhill bikes, or the 90s and the fragile downhill bikes, we are now in a position where you can actually have something that is light and strong, I'm not gonna say cheap, comparatively affordable. As a result, we've seen people going for heavier options, you know, bigger brake rotors, tire inserts, coil springs, other things like that. Things that weigh more, but perform better. And the tire inserts, other than coil springs, are probably the single best example of this because if you can afford to add four or 500 grams to your wheels and the bike is still quite rideable, but you can eliminate pinch flats and tire destruction and rim destruction and all the rest of it, fantastic. Likewise for coil springs, if you can make your suspension perform much better at a weight penalty that you can tolerate, then it becomes a lot more worthwhile. However, there are some nuances beyond simply weight to the coil and air spring thing. Now, we are not purists of one kind or another at Vorsprung. Uh, air has its place, coil has its place. They are suited to different applications. Coil springs, generally for people that just want the best in suspension performance, outright lowest friction, lower maintenance, less to go wrong. At the expense of weight, less adjustability, typically less progression up until the evolution of modern systems such as this. This is our smash pot coil conversion that have integrated anti-bottoming systems that aren't just some piece of crap elastomer jammed down in the middle of the fork spring, not looking at you RockShox or Marzocchi. So coil springs aren't for everyone. They are heavier, more prone to noise. You have parts that are not precisely located in the same way the air springs are, where you have an air piston moving up and down inside a bore, but the whole time it's isolated by a rubber seal or a glide ring. Coil springs don't have that precision guidance of the sliding parts. As a result, there's more potential for noise. That's why we have things like the spring isolator here to stop it knocking in the stanchion. Spring rate behavior of coils is obviously different to air. Coil springs themselves, unless they're progressively wound, which is relatively uncommon, 
I'm going to say that by and large they are completely linear or so close to linear that the nonlinearities are negligible. This has advantages and disadvantages when compared to an air spring. An air spring tends to be uh, very much stiff, soft, stiff. So with a coil spring, the advantages are in the first two thirds of the travel, where you have something that is much more consistent in terms of spring rate. So it's softer in the very first part of the travel and it's firmer in the middle of the travel. Unfortunately, it's also softer again at the end relative to an air spring uh, because the air springs are able to ramp up. So air springs definitely have some advantages there in terms of that end stroke bottoming control, uh, weight, noise, but obvious disadvantages in terms of friction, maintenance, the ability to run enough lubrication in a fork, for example. But air springs obviously have some obvious disadvantages in the form of friction, more maintenance, uh, more things to go wrong. You have seals to worry about. Anytime we can eliminate a seal, it's a good thing, especially moving ones. Static seals, not so problematic. They behave differently in terms of their ride height as well. So the static ride height of air springs, because they're stiffer in the initial travel, tends to mean that they sit higher when you first climb on the bike. For those of you who recall a long time ago in the Galaxy Far Far Away type thing, back in the day when the air springs really sucked, most people would run 25% sag in the rear of an air sprung bike and 30 to 33% in a coil sprung bike. Reason being, that initial stiffness of the air spring really threw the, the sag off. So it meant it sits higher in the travel. Now, as air springs have improved, that discrepancy has become smaller, but it still exists. As a result, if you convert from an air fork, for example, to a coil fork, uh, you'll typically find that you run more sag. Likewise, uh, if you upgrade your air spring with one of our products like the Luft Cap, that softens the initial stroke. The reason for this is that as we soften the initial stroke, obviously, you know, softer spring rate means more sag. The static ride height gets lower, which can be a problem or it could be a good thing depending on the geometry of your bike. But this brings us into a discussion on bicycle ride height. So the stiffer initial spring rate of air springs tends to mean that they did at least typically run considerably less sag. And that would mean, you know, as we see this green air spring curve here, that for the same amount of body weight, you would be less far into the travel. You would then have proportionally softer middle of the travel and then stiff end of the travel. And so this part here could be good for bump absorption, but very commonly is just perceived as a lack of mid-stroke support. And that is generally what people have been talking about with the term mid-stroke support over the years. Uh, that and leverage rates, long story. Anyway, what this means is that if you simply swap from say air to coil, uh, you can expect, depending on the characteristics that you are changing from and to, that you will see a change in the sag that's necessary to get the best performance from your bike. Even if the overall average spring rate, if we were to average it in terms of force to bottom out, is equivalent. Now, it wouldn't necessarily always be equivalent, but let's make that simplification. So if we change the spring rate to go from a coil spring to an air spring and get less sag, or maybe more sag, depending on the exact configuration, uh, the end stroke progression actually has quite a lot to do with that. Another story. Once you change the spring configuration, you can expect a change in sag. And sag basically is your static ride height. When you're on the bike, how high or low it sits. As a result, should you convert your fork from coil to air or air to coil, you're gonna see a change there. What that means is that, for example, let's look at the fork just to simplify things. With the fork, if you have more sag, your bars sit lower to begin with. This being a beautifully drawn front wheel, if your handlebar starts higher, for a given amount of displacement under brakes, it will end higher. Now, for those of you who are subscribed to our Fork and Fridays newsletters, You've already read this part. What this means is that if you change to a system where you run more sag, say for example, you go from this air spring curve here that crosses the body weight line here to a coil spring that runs a bit more sag, your handlebars are going to start lower. As a result, for a given amount of displacement here, they're gonna end lower. This is a large part of the perception of fork dive. Commonly, when people are experiencing fork dive, it's not necessarily that they're feeling the fork displacing too far. What they're feeling is that the front end of the bike, the handlebars, end up feeling too low. When they're braking, when they're on something steep, uh, essentially any sharp deceleration. Because of this, we have to look at, you know, how did we come to be in a position where the handlebars were too low? How are we going to address that? When people come to us, it's usually because they're looking for the suspension-based solution. And typically what that means is that they want to reduce this displacement, this delta between your initial bar height and your final bar height. And so what people are looking for is for their bars to go from here at a static position to 
here somewhere under brakes. Now, in order to cut down that displacement, let's say we're trying to cut it in half, then we need a spring rate that is twice as stiff. You run a spring rate that is twice as stiff, for starters, your bars will start higher because you have less sag. So if this is your sag bar height, you know, your new bar height might be somewhere up here. So that accounts for some of it. But once we have a spring rate that is twice as stiff, as we illustrated previously, you can only generate so much force. And so when that spring rate doubles, you go from here to there, all of a sudden, all the rest of this travel is above the amount of force that you can generate. So you have this much travel here, you essentially can't reach that travel. Uh, and then we have the condition where people start wondering, well, how do I get full travel out of my fork? If I run it stiff enough to be supportive the way that I want it to be, I can't use full travel. So then we have to address this problem from other angles. Either we can raise the static bar height, uh, which very often is the answer, especially for taller riders, but not always. Or we can try and reduce this displacement. Again, hard to do because it's dominated by the spring. We can try and slow down the rate of change between A and B uh, by increasing the compression damping. This can then lead to harshness and so forth. So our options for trying to reduce the perception of fork dive are either to reduce the displacement or change the ending point of the handlebars. The simplest way to do that is simply to move the handlebars up. What happens, however, if you get to the point where your handlebars are as far up as you can ride without causing other compromises and you are now still having to run the fork, let's say so firm that you can't achieve full travel. Well, then we have to look at other aspects. Are we actually happy with how the fork is performing other than not using full travel? Does it absorb bumps adequately? Is it sufficiently stable, sufficiently lively? Does it jump the way that we want it to? Is it predictable? Make sure our hands don't hurt more than they need to. If the answer to those questions is largely yes, then we've reached a condition where you simply have more travel than you need. So let's say we've determined that this blue line here is the spring rate that we like the best. Never mind the travel markers down the bottom. And this is our maximum load that we can physically put on the spring. Let's say we just have that much more travel. So now we can't place any more load on it than this. So all the rest of this travel down to here, which is uh, just a little bit past infinity, is useless. And that's why we're not riding 12 inch, 20 inch, 50 inch travel bikes. At a spring rate that we actually want to ride that preserves our geometry sufficiently, that gives us the feedback that we need and you know the ability to move the bike around, we would never be able to use the end of the travel. So there's no point in having it. That's why downhill bikes came back down in travel. But what you might find is that on your bike, when it's set up to climb, pedal, descend, jump, corner, the way that you want, all the things that you want it to do, and you have, let's say you have a 170 millimeter travel bike, but you never get the last 20 millimeters out of it. In reality, if you're happy with the other elements of performance, you need 150 millimeters of travel. Now, if you have a 170 millimeter bike, that doesn't mean you necessarily need to cut it down to 150 millimeters of travel. This means you're only using 150 millimeters. There's a few things that you can do if this really bothers you. With most forks, most modern forks, you can quite easily shorten the travel. So you can put a different air shaft in there. If you have coil conversion kit like our smash pot, you can adjust the travel internally. You can set it to what you need. However, that obviously also changes the geometry. If you don't want to change the geometry, the simplest solution might just be to cut your travel indicator o-ring off and then everyone lived happily ever after. Anyway, to bring this full circle back to what we were originally talking about at the start of part one of this episode, the reason that we're discussing this is to hopefully inspire some thought about uh, setting your bike up to ride the way that you want it to, rather than to try and hit both ends of the travel frequently so that you're using the full travel. Because if you imagine that you had the exact same ride characteristic, but your 150 millimeter fork magically became a 300 millimeter fork, you know, you might get to 160 millimeters or even 170 every now and then on really hard hits, but you would never get into the 250 millimeter, 300 millimeter range. So we would all agree universally that in that extreme case, that that's obviously wasted. You know, we don't need that. I hope that this kind of leads to people thinking about things from the point of view that set the bike up to ride the way that you want it, worry about whether it is pushing the o-ring all the way to the end of the stanchion afterwards, or down the line, consider shorter travel. You can use all of it. It doesn't cost you any less. It isn't necessarily any cheaper or even any lighter, but hey, if, you, uh, if you're paying for it, you might as well be using it. So goes the theory. Anyway, that's uh, my thoughts on this matter. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you think, but uh, until next time, I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.